interesting particles. And these systems are very well isolated from any sort of environment, so time-independent time employment. Okay? And this work was done with Mauro Schulas. Mauro is a postdoc working with me. And Jonathan Torres. Jonathan was a postdoc, but he has been a professor in Mexico for some time. Now, before I talk about time scales, let me set the scene. Uh, as you know, there is a lot of interest in non-equilibrium quantum dynamics, especially in the context of many body quantum systems. So there are interesting questions being addressed. For example, how does the dynamics depend on the Hamiltonian that describes the system, if it's a chaotic Hamiltonian or not? How does it depend on the range of interactions, if you have short range interactions or long range interactions? How is this dynamics affected by the proximity to a critical point? For example, as you get close to a transition from a metal to an insulator. In quantum information, a uh, topic that is interesting is uh, what are the conditions for you to reach a quantum speed limit, no? so how fast the system can evolve. And recently, we've seen this uh, revival no, of search for the exponential instability. So as you know, exponential instability is what you find at the classical domain. No? Chaotic systems um, have exponential instability, Lyapunov exponents. So people have been asking what is the counter, the quantum counterpart for that. This is an old question but it has been revived because of this quantity called out-of-time order correlator. And I'll mention a little bit more about that. And another question is, well, if the system is out of equilibrium, you may want to know if it will eventually equilibrate. And if it will equilibrate, is it thermal equilibrium or not? So that's the topic of thermalization. So many questions, they are not just theoretical questions. There is a lot of experimental interest. Um, the big sensations at the moment are the experiments with cold atoms and ion traps because they are highly controllable, very well isolated, so you can study coherent evolutions for very long times. But we should not forget the experiments with NMR. No, uh, NMR um, have in NMR, they have these techniques to reverse the dynamics. And uh, that's what you need to measure this quantity that I mentioned before, the out of time order correlated, which is this quantity here. Anyway, so interesting questions, a lot of progress, experimental progress. But there is this question hanging there, which is, how long does it take for the system to equilibrate? And that's what we want to discuss here. Okay? How long it takes and what are the different behaviors that we may find along this relaxation process. But to tell you about the time, I should tell you what we mean by equilibration in this system that is described by a time-independent Hamiltonian. And this is the point that has some consensus, what we call equilibration. But the idea is, let me call alpha the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian that is evolving the system. No? And uh, let's call this Cs, the overlap between my initial state and this energy eigenbase. And let's now pick an observable and let it evolve. So we can write the evolution of this observable with two terms. This first term here has the components of the initial state, the phases, which are the eigenvalues, and these off-diagonal terms. So this is the one that controls the dynamics. This other one is a time-independent term. No? It's what we get when alpha and beta are equal. So this controls the dynamics, and if you wait long enough, it will just lead to fluctuations. Fluctuations around this term here, which is the infinite time average, the asymptotic value. So that's what we are calling equilibration, and that we just have these fluctuations around this infinite time average. So to call this equilibration, you have to be sure that these fluctuations are really very small. And we know they are because we are dealing with many body systems without many degeneracies, perturbed, far from equilibrium, so these components are very small. So we know these fluctuations are small, and we know they decrease exponentially the system size. Okay? So this is what we are calling equilibrium. You could ask, okay, so now I reach this equilibrium, is it thermal equilibrium or not? And this question is, will this infinite time average agree or not with uh, a thermodynamic average, like a microcanonical average? If it does, that's what people would call thermalization. You may have heard about the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. What this is telling us is, well, if I compute this expectation value, so this O alpha alpha is the expectation value of the observable. No? So if I compute that with one eigenstate or with another eigenstate that is very close in energy, and these results are all very similar, well, then I'll have this agreement because just one expectation value is enough uh, to coincide with the average. So this is what beca became known as eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. You need just one eigenstate. But this is just a definition. No? This is still not explaining when this would be true. And when this holds is when you have chaos, quantum chaos, chaotic states. And so if you go back to these uh, recent reviews, 
you will see thermalization chaos, thermalization chaos. Yeah, so this is the condition, is the mechanism for thermalization. If you want, I can talk to you more about this, but what I want to address today is how long it takes to reach this point. Yeah? So this is the story of the time scales. And to answer that question, we use two main ingredients in our analysis. One is the properties of the spectrum. Yeah? So what are the manifestations of the properties of the spectrum in the dynamics of the system? Manifestation of properties of the spectrum show up at very long times because this dynamics has to resolve the discreteness of the spectrum. And long times is what we are interested in. Kay? So very long times because we are looking at properties of the spectrum. The other thing is we are studying many body systems, so we have many interacting particles. Instead of studying the dynamics in real space, which makes sense if you have just one particle or uh, independent particles, we are going to study the dynamics in the many body Hilbert space. What does it mean is we prepare the system in a many-body state, and we are going to see how this many-body state spreads out into other many-body states, how it spreads out in this many-body uh, Hilbert space. Kay? So these are the two important ingredients. Now, since properties of the spectrum is an important uh, element in our analysis, I have to tell you a little bit about level statistics. Now, so when you, you think about level statistics, what comes to mind immediately is random matrix theory. So what is the story about random matrix theory? Now you have these matrices, full random matrices, so matrices filled with random numbers. The only constraint is that it should satisfy the symmetries of the system that you're trying to describe. So that's what Wigner used to try to describe statistically the spectrum, um, of uh, statistically the levels um, of a heavy nuclei, which is a very complex system. Now so instead of going for the details of the interactions with the nucleus, you know, just fill this matrix with random numbers. They have interesting properties. Um, if you look at the eigenvalues of these random matrices, you'll see that they are very much correlated, meaning they repel each other. No? So they are, they are kind of aware, they're correlated. So they repel each other, they avoid crossing. And there are different ways to detect these correlations. One, which is the most popular one, is just to look at the distribution of the spacing between neighboring levels. Pick all these spacings, make a histogram, and you get a distribution that looks this like this red one, which is known as Wigner-Dyson distribution. So you see there is no spacing close to zero. You have level repulsion. Kay? So this is one of the quantities. And uh, it's the most popular one, but this quantity only detects short range correlations. If you ever want to do a proper analysis of the spectrum, you should look at other quantities. In our case, we are not interested only in short range, we are also interested in long range correlation. Okay, I'll stick to this one because it's just the most popular one. Okay, but this matrix is completely filled with ra random numbers. It's not realistic. No? There is no system that is described by a matrix completely filled. So Vigna himself introduced what is known as band random matrix. So it's matrices that have random numbers, but just within a band, and everywhere else is zero. I'm trying to bring these ideas closer to realistic systems. And there is a zoology of different random matrices. There are power law band random matrices. Another kind of random matrix that is very physical is this one that is known as two-body random ensembles. So what you have there are just two-body term with random numbers here and one-body term. So this is the kind of Hamiltonian that has been studied by everybody in the quantum chaos community. You may have heard about the SYK model, no? the Sashdev, Ye, and Kitayev model, which became very popular. Well, this is a two-body random ensemble, even though they don't tell you that. This is just the two-body random ensemble. Very well. So all of these matrices that I'm telling you here, they have some random elements. But you could have a Hamiltonian like this one that I'm giving here, spin system, without any kind of randomness. And still, you could have level statistics similar to random matrices. Yeah, so randomness is not uh, necessary. You may have correlated elements here. Very well. So this is an example of data from a real nucleus. This is what we get from this uh, spin model without random elements. So I'll be calling systems that show level repulsion like this chaotic. And why we are calling them chaotic? Because there is this quantum classical correspondence that I mentioned before. This is well established for one body system okay, that says the following. If at the classical limit the system is chaotic in the sense that you have a positive Lyapunov exponent, then in the quantum limit, you will have statistics such as this one. Okay, so there are several 
numerical demonstrations for that, and there is also semi-classical treatments for one body system. More recently, people have been validating this correspondence in terms of the dynamics also. So there are some papers by Galitsky, for example, for one body systems, again, for kick rotor, for billiards, what they showed is the following. They measured the quantity that I mentioned to you, the out of time order correlated for the quantum system, and they see an exponential growth of this quantity, the out of time order correlated. And then they, they check that the rate of this exponential growth coincide with the classical Lyapunov exponent. So it's a validation, again, of this quantum classical correspondence. But this was done for one body system. A step up in this story is this work by Jorge Hirsch. Jorge is a professor in Mexico where they studied the DK model. So the DK model has many atoms in a quantized field. And again, they show this correspondence between the um, quantum rate and the classical Lyapunov exponent. Why I'm saying this is a step up? Because things are clear for one body systems. The main question is what happens with m when you have many bodies. And this is not clear at all. There are lots of studies going on for this semi-classical analysis. I'm going to simplify the story, and I'm just going to say, if I see this kind of distribution, I'll call my system chaotic, okay? But this is open subject. All right. So we are seeing level statistics similar to what we have for full random matrices, but what are the differences? No, I just said that the, if I look at the Hamiltonian matrix, it's very different for these realistic systems, very sparse matrices, banded. So where are the differences? For example, if you look at the density of states, histogram of all the eigenvalues. For full random matrix, you have the famous semicircle. For these many body systems that we have, that have just two body interaction, you have a Gaussian shape. Okay, so this is an important difference. Where else do we find differences? If you look at the eigenstates. So the eigenstates of full random matrices, these, they are these huge superpositions where all of these coefficients are just random numbers. So they are random vectors. And so this is just a parenthesis, but if you study thermalization in this context of full random matrices, everything is trivial. Let me just remind you of what we are calling thermalization, right? We want to know if this infinite time average agrees with the thermodynamic average. If all of my eigenstates are just random vectors, if I compute this, this expectation value, with one random vector, with another random vector, of course the result will be all very similar. And so, of course, this will be satisfied. So in, in the context of full random matrix, this is trivial. But things become more interesting when we go to realistic systems. In when we are in with realistic systems, there is an energy dependence. It's in the middle of the spectrum that you can have these states that are very much spread out, not random vectors, but close to that. But at the edges, they are pretty localized. So let me show to you what we are I'm showing here. So write a state in a certain basis. And I'm computing this quantity that is known as participation ratio. So it's 1 over the sum of these coefficients to the fourth. So if the state is very much spread out, you have many, many Cs. And so the participation ratio will be very large. So here I'm showing the participation ratio for all of the eigenstates of a random matrix. And you see that all the values are pretty much the same, proportion to the dimension of the Hilbert space. They are very much spread out. In a realistic system, well, it's large in the middle of the spectrum, not at the edge. Okay, so this is just an introduction for the jargon, and so then um, I can now move to the dynamics. Okay. So I know I come from a different community. If you have questions, ask. Yeah, go on. Correlations of? Correlation for the eigenvalues? For a system that has a gap? Okay, so... This, this, you pick all of your eigenvalues, okay? But you discard the edges. Now, the edges is the region where there are fluctuations. So if you have a gap, it should be ground state. So this is not going to be affected here, yeah? So I'm looking at the bulk, not uh, at the edges of the spectrum. Yeah. SYK. It depends on what is the question that you're asking. Now, so if you're studying the dynamics, are you going to pick an initial state that has energy close to the edge or a state that has energy close to the middle of the spectrum? Depends on the question. Okay, but if, if you want to identify if the system is chaotic or not, you discard the edges. The edges has too many fluctuations. Also. 
All right, so time scales. Um, so the story of the time scales. There are different studies about the relaxation time. And what we saw is that some of these studies have uh, contradictory results. You'll find that some studies that say that the relaxation time should increase with system size. Others say that it should decrease with system size. And then what we decided to do is, well, let's pick a realistic system because many of these studies are based on abstract mathematical models. So let's pick a realistic system that is accessible experimentally and let's see what we get there. First, let's see that and then see how we can generalize our results. So we picked this system here, it's a spin system, uh, so sigma Pauli matrices, one dimension. So this term here, the XXYY is the one that moves the excitation along the chain, uh, like a hopping term, and this is the term of interaction. And you see that uh, we have here just couplings between nearest neighbors. And this is the term of on-site disorder. What this term is telling us is that on each site we have a different Zeeman splitting randomly distributed. Okay? So these random numbers, Hn, will vary from minus H to H. So H is the strength of my disorder. Another important parameter here is L, the size of the chain. And we are going to look at the largest subspace where half of the chain has spins pointing up. Okay? So this is the dimension of the Hilbert space. And so this is a model that was uh, studied. Now I have to advertise something for the Brazilians. This model was studied with Escobar. For some of you may remember Escobar. Carlos Escobar is a famous high energy physicist in Brazil, now retired. So we studied this model in 2004 in the context of um, localization. We studied the structure of the eigenstates. We studied entanglement and also level statistics. This model became very popular since around 2008 because of the story of localization in the presence of interaction. Okay. But so, uh, what is this that we did with Escobar at uh, this time? Well, for example, the characterization of the system in terms of the eigenvalues. So when the disorder is not too strong of the order of coupling strengths, the system is chaotic in the sense that I mentioned to you before. Uh, level statistics like um, random matrix. As we increase this disorder and it becomes larger than this coupling strength, you see that it will get more and more deformed and eventually gets a Poisson distribution. This is in the limit when the system becomes uh, localized. This is telling us that the eigenvalues now are uncorrelated. Okay. So let me tell you the results, and then I'll go for the details. What did we see for this system? First, we found not just one time scale, but two time scales, very long time scales. One is what we are calling Thalys time. So the concept of Thalys time is well understood in systems without interaction. Now we have uh, an interpretation for Thales time with interaction. I will explain to you what it means. Okay. The other time, even after the Thales time, is finally the relaxation time, the time to reach those fluctuations. The surprise is both times increase exponentially with system size. Okay, so this is saying that it will take an exponentially large time for this system to finally relax to equilibrium. This is when the system is chaotic. What happens as we approach localization? So uh, we have these two time scales. The Thales time will get longer and longer, closer and closer to this relaxation time. Okay. And when they merge together, it's when the system localizes. So we have a many numerical results, but the core of the paper is really analytical results. Okay. All right, so some details now. This is the model. I'm going to prepare the system in states like this which in quantum information we would call computational basis vectors. So on each side of the spin that points up or down in the z direction, let it evolve according to this whole Hamiltonian. When we do this no, kind of quench, this means very, very strong perturbation. I'm starting with a Hamiltonian that has just components in the z direction, and I'm letting the system evolve according to the whole Hamiltonian. So it's very, very strong perturbation. Strong perturbation, the other thing is, remember that I said there is this energy dependence. So we are going to pick initial states that have energy very close to the middle of the spectrum. So this combination, middle of the spectrum, a very strong perturbation means that our initial state is very much spread out in the energy eigenbasis. So the initial dynamics will be explosive, okay, but not forever. The other thing is we are going to do averages. Averages over disorder realizations and averages over initial states, big, big averages. If you don't do these averages, you don't see all the features that I'm going to describe. Okay, okay so I'm going to show results for this model. 
because of uh, its in experimental interest, but the results are not uh, just for this model, it's very general. Any model that satisfies the same symmetries of the system, and I'll tell you later what they are, will have the same behavior, okay, so general. The second thing is we want to extract what is universal. And to extract what is universal for these dynamics, we compare the model with full random matrices. Okay, so the realistic case is initial states like this, evolving with this Hamiltonian. In the side of random matrix, what we do is very unphysical, okay, but we are considered that the diagonal part of the random matrix is determining my initial state, and I let it evolve according to this whole Hamiltonian. But to try to extract what is common to this full random matrix and to the realistic system. All right, quantities that we are going to study. I'm going to spend a long time talking about this quantity here, which is the survival probability, you know, the probability for finding my initial state later in time, because it's easy to explain and because also we have analytical results for this quantity. But I'm going to show later also results for the spin autocorrelation function. This is equivalent to the density imbalance that is measured in cold atoms. So this is a, a local observable and it's an experimental observable. At long times, the behavior of the survival probability and the spin autocorrelation function is very similar, comparable, same time scales. Okay. All right, so starting with the survival probability, I'm going to write it with the components of the initial state and those phases. Let me open this square here similar to what we did in the beginning for the observable, so we have these two terms. This one controls the dynamics, and this is the, the infinite time average. All right. Let's start by studying the system in the chaotic region, where the eigenvalues are very much correlated, where the eigenstates close to the middle of the spectrum, um, big superpositions, fill the energy shell, is what we call chaotic states. Okay, so starting with the chaotic region. So look at this big panel here, this big figure. This is showing the entire result for the survival probability, starting from one all the way to the saturation. The saturation depends only on the components of the, in the initial state. Because we are in the middle of the spectrum, because we have very strong perturbation, this term means a very small value, no? so we saturate to a very small value that is inversely proportional to the dimension of the Hilbert space. What happens in between? You see different behavior showing up, but let's compare these results with this small figure here. This is what we get for full random matrices. Okay. So initially, I have here Gaussian decay, then a power law decay, you know, slows down, becomes power law. If I compare it with what we get for full random matrix, we see that the behavior is very different. Here I have a Bessel function and a power law also, but with exponent three. So this initial behavior is very different, so it's not universal. But at long times, you see this dip, this dip below the saturation point. This is universal. This shows up also for full random matrices. Okay. And then finally, the saturation. So the times that I mentioned to you before that I'm interested in are these two times. Okay, but let me explain the whole thing from the beginning all the way to that point. Okay. All right, so um, starting with the short time behavior. So remember, this was the expression for the survival probability. I'm going to write it with an integral. So this row here, you know, so that these two things are equal, this row here is the sum of this delta function. Sum of delta functions means density of states, but with those components for the initial state. So that's why we call it, instead of density of states, we call it local density of states because it has this component, so L dos. Okay. Now you see that if I know this L dos, I know the survival probability, I just need to do a Fourier transform. So let's have a look at this LDOS first. Okay. Well, before telling you about the LDOS, let me remind you about the density of states. So without the components, this is just the density of states for full random matrix semicircle for our many body system with two body interaction gauge. Okay. Now let's put the components there. If I put the components there for full random matrix, I'm just putting a bunch of random numbers. And again, I get to the same semicircle. In the case of the realistic system, I get the Gaussian again, but I get the Gaussian because I'm in mean that limit, again, I keep repeating the same thing, but initial state close to the middle of the spectrum, strong perturbation, and system with two body interactions. So this is what I was saying is general. If my system satisfies this, these conditions, the initial behavior will be the same. I don't need to have just that uh, spin model. 
if I move away from these conditions, then this shape will change. Uh, so for example, if I pick an initial state with energy close to the edge, then I could have a skewed Gaussian and my dynamics could be slower. If I don't have strong perturbation, then this distribution wouldn't be so uh, broad. It could be narrower, it could be a Lorentzian, it could be even narrower. And so the dynamics could be slower. I'm going to focus here only on this um, scenario, okay? But if you want, I can discuss with you these others. Okay, so now what we have to do, as we said, just the Fourier transform. Fourier transform of the semicircle gives us a Bessel function and uh, numerics and analytics match it perfectly. Fourier transform of the Gaussian gives us a Gaussian decay. Okay, this gamma that you're seeing here is the width of this distribution. No? So one of our gamma is the first important time scale, is the time scale for the depletion of this initial state. All right, but what comes next? Longer time. If I study this function no, at long times, you will see that it gives us a power law decay with exponent three. So what happens is the Bessel function gives us these oscillations, but the envelope is a power law with exponent three. What determines this exponent is how we approach the bounds in the spectrum. And in the case of the semicircle, it's abruptly. Okay, so this gives the exponent three. For the realistic system, if I take the bounds into account, I get a pa uh, power law decay alpha but with exponent two. You can see this mathematically, just a quick thing. So if I put the take the bounds into account of a Gaussian distribution, yes, you get a Gaussian, but with some error functions. And if you study this asymptotically, you get, get this exponent three. So in the beginning, people were a bit, bit suspicious about <laughs> our, our two bumps. <laughs> and I was uh, trying to claim that this was uh, power law behavior, but now we have larger systems and uh, yeah, it's there, the t2 minus two. Okay. All this just to explain this initial behavior. So again, it's not universal. This initial behavior depends on the model, on the initial state, yeah, on the strength of the perturbation. What we are interested in now is this behavior, the, the dip. And we haven't talked about it so far, because so far I only looked at the envelope of this distribution. Never said about what is inside. Now we are dealing with a quantum system that is finite, so the spectrum is discrete. I cannot just look at the envelope. The spectrum is discrete, and as we said, the eigenvalues are very much correlated. So there is another term that is important in this dynamics, and this other term is what brings us to this hole. It's called correlation hole, because it's caused by correlations in the eigenvalues. So this correlation hole, if anyone is interested, I can tell you about the math. This correlation hole shows up only at long times because it was the time for the dynamics to realize, ah, the spectrum is discrete, not only the envelope matters. Kay. And this is a direct manifestation of level repulsion. And then comes the question, uh, what is quantum chaos for many body systems? Kay. If we stick to this idea that quantum chaos is signatures uh, of level repulsion, as we've been doing before for one body system, you will find these manifestations only at very long times. Or is it chaos uh, exponential instability? If it is exponential instability, as the high energy physics community is claiming now, then short times is enough, and you don't need level repulsion. So there is this question that is open. Very well. The correlation hole was studied before in random matrices, also in molecules. It was studied before just as another tool to analyze uh, spectrum properties. No, so they were not interested in dynamics. We are bringing the subject for the dynamics. And since this was studied before, there is a function that describes, so this function here describes this correlation hole. The sort of molecules, why were they interested in that? The issue is in molecules, you don't have very good line resolution. No, so to study level statistics, it was hard. It's different from nucleus. So they said, well, let's do the Fourier transform of all these eigenvalues and see if we can detect level repulsion there. Kay. Anyway, so we are bringing this subject for the dynamics. This is the quantity that describes the whole four random matrices. And since our level of statistics is the same, we are going to use the same function for our realistic system. Kay. So now we have everything. I described the whole dynamics, so I can put everything together in one expression. So I'm putting everything together like this, but we derive this analytically, okay? So this is the expression for the evolution of the survival probability for full random matrices. This first term 
describes the initial dynamics. This is the correlation hole. And then finally, the saturation. This analytical expression is shown here in red, and in black is the numeric, and you see perfect agreement. Yeah? OK, now let's go for the realistic system. Again, we put everything together. Again, we have an analytical derivation for this. Okay. So this first term is describing the initial dynamics, which is different from full random matrix. We already said this is not universal. Then we have the correlation hole, which is universal, and then the saturation. So this is our analytical expression, and I'm showing it here with these dots. And the numeric is this black line. So again, perfect agreement. And it's really good because this is a log log plot. Okay, So you see the long, long times that are being uh, studied here. OK, so now comes the story. Uh, OK, so this was for that disorder model that I mentioned before. So in this plot, we have that disorder model with different system sizes. So dash line is that analytical expression. Solid is the numeric. So very good agreement. These are completely different models. This is a model that has no disorder, clean. And you see, again, good agreement. And this is a kind of random matrix that we created. And again, very good agreement. Okay, so that's what I was telling you is general. If I have a um, level repulsion, if I have a system perturbed far from equilibrium, just two body, low, and so on, you get a good agreement with that expression. All right, so now that we have the expression, we can extract those two time scales that we are interested in. So we already talked about one, one over gamma, the depletion of the initial state. So now let's focus on the long time. And now to explain. We can just go for the analytical result and extract these times, but we are given an interpretation for this time here, which is the time to reach the minimum of the whole. That's what we are calling Fowler's time. So let me tell you what Fowler's time is for a non-interacting system. No? So it's just the time that it takes for a particle to diffuse through this uh, disordered uh, center. And what is it that we are calling Fowler's time now in this system that is uh, many body, no? many interacting particles? So our interpretation is the following. We are starting with a many-body state, such as this one. And gradually, this many-body state will be visiting other many-body states accessible to its energy. So it's going to be spreading in this many-body uh, Hilbert space. The time that it takes for it to spread all over, visit all of these states, that's what we are calling Tallis time. You know, so it's an interpretation for Tallis time in this many-body Hilbert space. How do we know? that the time to reach the minimum of the whole is the time to visit this whole Hilbert space. Because we computed this quantity, I inverse participation ratio, what is that? It's the sum of the probabilities to find my initial state in any of those basis vectors. Okay? So it started at 1, and it decays. It reaches the minimum value at the same time where we reach the minimum of the whole. Okay? So that's our interpretation for the tallest time this complete spread in this many-body Hilbert space. There is another reason why we are calling it Tallis time, which is it coincides with the inverse of the Tallis energy. So this is more technical. We obtain this Tallis energy from analysis of um, with random matrix technique. But um, I can tell you if you're interested. Okay. Anyway, this is the interpretation. But what we want is to extract this time. So how can we extract this time from this expression? Well, this first term is the one leading to this decay. The B2 is the one that brings us up. So we have to find where they meet. So I studied this one at long times, this one at short times, do the derivative, and we get uh, this expression. Can do the same thing for full random matrix. No? So this is for the realistic system. This is what we get for full random matrix. The expression is similar, but the values are completely different. And why is that? because of this gamma here. Remember, this gamma is the width of this energy distribution. This width depends on how many states are directly coupled with your initial state. Uh, so in other words, it depends on how many off-diagonal terms you have in your Hamiltonian matrix. In the case of full random matrix, it's directly coupled with everything. Uh, it's the case that is completely unphysical. So the, this width is proportional to the square root of the dimension of the matrix. In a realistic system, how many states are directly coupled with my initial state? It depends on how many excitations I have. So it's very small. So it's the square root of the size of the chain. So this makes a big difference. Because if I put this now in the expression, 
this time to reach the minimum of the hole for full random matrix is just a constant. The time to reach the minimum of the hole for a realistic system grows exponentially with system size. Okay. Now, can we understand this? The idea is, as we said, we started with a many body state that has ahead of it an exponentially large Hilbert space. And to visit this exponentially large Hilbert space, it can only use a two body kind of interaction. It goes gradually. So it takes an exponentially large time to visit it. Okay. So this is what we are calling it all this time. Very well. The other time, the time to finally reach the saturations, we are going to get just from the correlation hole, because this one is already too small. So we, we care about this term at long times. So this term at long time shows a power law behavior. So you have the saturation here, and we are getting there through this power law. So once we are already inside the fluctuations, we will say, OK, we're saturated. That's good enough. So this little delta here is just to say we are within the fluctuation. So from this V2, we get this expression. It's the same, of course, for full random matrix, because now things became universal. And what is this time? Well, gamma is the width of the distribution. D is the dimensions, the number of states that we have wi within. So this width divided by how many states we have here is the mean level spacing. Now, so the time that we are getting here is just the inverse of the mean level spacing, which is just the Heisenberg time. The Heisenberg time is the largest possible time scale in the system. But the nice thing is we are getting the Heisenberg time from this analytical expression. So it validates our analytical expression again. OK. so. We got to the two time scales now. We can just go for the numeric just for, for me to emphasize uh, that everything is working very well. So this is just for random matrices. The matrix is increasing from top to bottom. And you see that the minimum of the whole, no reaction, no? because uh, it's the constant. The saturation time, the Heisenberg time is increasing. And the everything matches very well. Let's go for the realistic system. For the realistic system, as we increase the system size, both increase Pauli's and relaxation, increase exponential with system size. Let's make this more quantitative. So this is the Pauli's, the line. This dashed line is the relaxation, the estimate. And the dots are numerical results. And you see very good agreement. Now remember, this is heavy numerical calculation. We are going from 10 to 20 system size, 10 to 5 data. No? So but very good agreement. The other thing that you see is the time to reach the minimum of the hole and the time to saturate, they are diverging, which means uh, we are getting that hole like longer and longer. Okay. This is for the survival probability, global quantity. How about the spin autocorrelation function, which is a local experimental quantity? What this quantity measures is how close we are to the initial spin configuration later in time. So this is the physical quantity, and this is the whole evolution for it. At short times, things are not uh, similar to survival probability, but at long times, the behavior is very much the same. The minimum of the whole, the whole is not exclusive to survival probability, it's also in this uh, quantity, and then the saturation. Things are so similar that we use those estimates from the survival probability, and the results match the numerical results for the spin autocorrelation very well. OK, so uh, this, is, this is just uh, to tell you. We identify two different time scales. They're increasing exponentially with system size. Now what I wanted to talk about is, well, so this is a surprising result already. No? So relaxation, thermalization, increasing exponentially with system size. But what I wanted to talk about now is what happens as we increase the disorder. Kay. So as we increase the disorder, there are some interesting results at short times already, we are mostly interested now in long times, but let me just um, summarize what we have for short times. OK, so this is the behavior short times. This is the power law that I had shown to you with exponent 2. As we increase the disorder, the system, the eigenstates become less extended. The dynamic slows down. So we have this power law behaviors with the exponents that are becoming smaller and smaller. OK, so um, let me remind you. We are increasing the disorder, so we are going from this regime of chaos to the regime where we have uncorrelated eigenvalues. So to study this transition from one to the other, there are different quantities that we can use to measure how close I'm, I am to a Vigna Dyson, how close I am to a Poisson. 
So this is what we showed in this work with Escobar. No? So this quantity eta is telling me how close I am to one or the other. So when eta is very small, it's vignadized. When eta is very close to one, it's Poisson. So what we show there is as the disorder increases, we go from vignadizing to Poisson, as I already said. Okay. How about the eigenstates? So we are looking here at the participation ratio. Remember the participation ratio, right? You write your state in a certain basis. In this case, I'm picking the computational basis because we are studying localization in space. And uh, we compute this participation ratio, one over the sum of those coefficients. When the system is chaotic, participation ratio is very large, proportional to the dimension of the system. As we increase the disorder, phew, it goes down. You know, the system walk wise. So this was the work with Escobar. What we did later with Jonathan was, okay, let's analyze what is going on here. You know, so there were some people was, uh, yeah, asking me about the fractal dimension. No? So we, we studied what it was going on here between chaos and localization. And we have this participation ratio also, but it's not now proportional to the dimension. It's a bit smaller. It's dimension to a power. No? And this power here is what is known as fractal dimension. You can do scaling analysis to extract this fractal dimension. So what we showed with Jonathan is, that's very nice, this power law decay, this exponent here, coincides with the D2. You know, so it coincides with the fractal dimension. So this is a work that uh, we like very much, but that's not the main topic here. The main topic here is what happens next. Yeah? So what happens next, that's the region of the correlation hole that I mentioned to you. Manifestations of um, uh, level repulsion, manifestations of spectral properties. So what do we have there as the disorder increases? The hole starts disappearing. And you can see this better in these individual panels. You see the, the hole here is becoming shallower and shallower because we are killing the correlation as we increase the disorder. But more interesting than that is not only it's becoming shallower, but it's becoming postponed to longer time. So you can see this well if you compare this, H1 and H2. So the meaning of the hole is more or less here, and then it's much later. Okay, so what we are calling tau this time is becoming much uh, much postponed. So then we studied this quantity, the time to reach the meaning of the whole, as a function of the disorder strength. And you see that it grows exponentially with the disorder. Grows exponentially and approaches the relaxation time. So for people studying uh, metal insulation transition, this is a very nice result. Because in non-interacting systems, people study this ratio, you know, the Heisenberg time, the largest possible time scale in your system, divided by the Tauli's time, the time for the particle to diffuse. So this is known as Tauli's dimensionless conductance. And uh, it's big in the metallic phase and approaches one as the system localized. So we are seeing the same feature for this system that has interaction. Okay? So approaching one. It's approaching one based on the survival probability, global quantity, maybe not so easy to measure experimentally, but it's approaching one also if you look at the spin alpha correlation function. And so this gives us uh, another quantity to study this metal insulating transition. Okay. All right, so, uh, so then I can summarize the story. What do we have here? Two different time scales, very long time scales, increase exponential with the system size. So that's the issue now. What is it that the experimentalists were measuring when they talk about thermalization? Uh, increase exponential with the system size. How did we get this analytical result based on two main ingredients? The study of the spectrum properties in the dynamics. So they show up at long times because we have to resolve the discreteness of the spectrum. And the study of the dynamics not in real space because we have many body systems. So dynamics in the many body Hilbert space. So what we are calling Pauli's time is this spread in this many body Hilbert space. Okay? Yeah, so that's it. Thank you for your attention. And we can go for questions. Well, thank you, Leah, for the talk. Yes. Okay. We have time for questions. Thanks, Leo, for, for, for a great talk. Um, I just want 